Good evening. My name is Ryan Boryak. I'm the Cameron Parish Administrator and President of the Chenier Plain Coastal Restoration and Protection Authority. But more importantly, tonight, I'm here as a father to three lovely and spirited young ladies who represent the sixth generation of my family to reside in Grand Chenier, Louisiana in Lower Cameron Parish. Coastal protection and restoration is one of those few issues that we can come together uh, that are not tied directly to a profession or a gender or a political party or political boundaries. So it is my pleasure tonight uh, to discuss this issue that impacts all of us in South Louisiana. For me, it's fairly simple. Uh, the economy, the ability to mitigate future disaster events, and the sustainability of a culture and way of life are all directly tied to the successes that we have in implementing coastal protection and restoration projects in South Louisiana. For all the candidates and attendees tonight, uh, you all are to be commended for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to commit to our coast and the businesses and families and communities who reside there. I'd like to thank the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana for pulling this forum together, as well as the partners who are being very supportive of this event. I look forward to a very lively discussion here this evening. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, Ms. Kim Ryer. Good evening. I'm Kim Ryer. I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for being here tonight. Um, thanks to Ryan um, and Cameron, you're on the, the front lines and we, we appreciate and very much need your frontline perspective. I'd also like to thank our partners in this endeavor tonight. And if you look at your program, you'll find on the back a list of 27 partners these are organizations that endorse the idea of a conversation of this sort with the candidates in the race, and they helped us promote the event. What you should notice, please, is the diversity of partners. So we have business and economic development interests, we have hunting and fishing organizations, and the diversity here represents the breadth and depth of concern about coastal issues. Tonight is the fourth Coastal Issues Forum that CRCL has hosted but the first one here in the 3rd Congressional District and the first one here in Lake Charles. We hold these forums because think, we think that it's, it's critical that voters across Louisiana understand the issues, the beliefs, the action plans of candidates running to hold public office in the state that faces significant challenges related to coastal management. CRCL is in a unique position to hold a convening role for events such as this because we're the oldest statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to coastal restoration in the state. Our mission is to drive bold, science-based action to rebuild our coast through outreach, restoration, and advocacy. Land loss has been accelerating across the region for decades. Since 1932, over 270,000 acres of wetlands have been lost due to extensive hydrological alterations, erosion, sea level rise, and subsidence. Land that our grandparents walked, once walked on has vanished in our lifetimes. In the wake of Hurricane Rita, the state created the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, charged with providing comprehensive solutions for coastal Louisiana. Over the past decade, in this area alone, the state has completed numerous critical shoreline stabilization and marsh creation and restoration projects. The state has also developed the 2017 Coastal Master Plan, which includes an additional 43 projects slated for Southwest southwest region of the state. Despite these successes, many challenges persist, and it is evident that concentrated and sustained work must be done by the southwest parishes, the state, and our federal congressional delegation if we are to maintain the focus and momentum that this challenge requires. We're fortunate, as Ryan mentioned, that these issues are not partisan. In fact, there's broad support for the action we need to protect ourselves. A recent poll by the Mississippi River Delta Coalition found that of 80% of the respondents in the southwest part of our state, 80% of the respondents recommended more funding to be invested in coastal protection in the next decade. Tonight, we are delighted to hear from four of the five candidates that we invited to participate in our event. We are very disappointed that Representative Clay Higgins decided not to join us this evening, but despite his absence, we expect a lively exchange of ideas. 
Before we introduce our moderator and our candidates, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mitchell Adrian, Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs for McNeese State University. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, again, my name is Mitch Adrian. I'm Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at McNeese. Just wanted to welcome you. Uh, hope you have a good evening here. Thank you for coming. I grew up south of Louisiana, excuse me, south of Lake Charles, uh, kind of in the area where the dry land starts to turn into the wetlands and marsh. And over my lifetime, I've watched how things have changed uh, in our landscape. You know, I, I see new neighborhoods pop up. I see coast coastlines of roads. So you can tell that there's a big impact um, here in our, our local. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to say what will eventually affect our local economy, but just because the biodiversity of our area and the importance of flood control with our coastline has a huge impact on us. At McNeese, we have some of the, wor the world's foremost experts on some of these subject areas, and we support uh, student research in coastal erosion, uh, coastline preservation, wetlands, uh, wetlands preservation, and so on. Uh, our faculty in areas such as uh, marine biology, uh, civil engineering, even genetics, do considerable amount of research in the area. We even have a guy who's considered the world's foremost expert on crocodilians. So if you ever want to know about alligators, he's the guy to go to. So again, this is, this is a topic that impacts us all. And at McNeese, we are very aware of all this and want to stay at the forefront of research in the area. So again, thank you for coming. We hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator this evening, CRCL's Communications Director, Jimmy Frederick. Jimmy joined the coastal restoration effort in 2014 after a 20-year career in public relations, governmental affairs, and local and regional media. Jimmy? Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Kim. And we welcome everyone to our Coastal Issues Forum. This evening, we are solely focused on one issue. And as Kim and Ryan and Dr. Adrian have said, they have far-reaching ramifications, not only for our state, but also for our country. The overarching question for tonight is how our next representative will deal with restoring coastal Louisiana at the federal level. Tonight's forum will consist of opening statements and then eight carefully crafted questions that each candidate will answer, and they will have one minute and 30 seconds to do so each. Then we will close with, with closing statements. Before we get started with the opening statements, I would like to let you know how we're planning to accommodate the other candidates who are not on stage with us tonight. As many of you are aware, there are seven declared candidates for the U.S. congressional seat, for this congressional seat. When we began this process, there were no independent polls available to help us narrow the field. So we vetted a process by which any candidate who had raised any money for their campaign according to the Federal Election Commission data as of August 31st, 2018, would be asked to participate. This is how we arrived at the five candidates we invited. Four of those candidates are here with us tonight. Representative Higgins declined our invitation. Regardless, we are very, very interested to hear all of the ideas and all of the thoughts from all candidates on coastal restoration and coastal issues here in the state. To that end, we have given all candidates an opportunity to answer the eight questions that we ask here tonight, either in written or video form, and we will post that to our website at CRCL and also highlight that on our social media platforms. So now let me introduce our candidates. I ask that you hold your applause, please, until all candidates have been introduced. We start off with our first candidate, Mr. Josh Guillory. Mr. Guillory is a small business owner and a family law attorney. He has fought for families throughout southwest Louisiana while also lecturing on constitutional law for several years. A former officer in the U.S. Cavalry, Mr. Guillory was deployed during Operation Iraqi Freedom. He is a lifetime member of the NRA and lives with his wife and children in Youngsville, Louisiana. Welcome, Mr. Guillory. Thank you. Our next candidate is the Honorable Mimi Methvin. Judge Methvin served as a U.S. Magistrate Judge for the Western District of Louisiana at Lafayette from 1983 to 2009 and a part-time magistrate judge for the District of Maryland and the Middle District of Pennsylvania. She currently serves on the Fifth Circuit Advisory Committee for the American Ends of Court Foundation and is a board member of the Federal Bar Association, Acadiana Chapter, and AMI Kids Acadiana. Welcome, Judge Methvin. Our third candidate is Mr. Larry Rader. 
Mr. Rader was born in a small rural community and is one of eight children. He is a veteran of two services, the Air Force and the Army. Mr. Rader has served as past president for the Port of Iberia and the past chairman for Iberia Parish Mosquito Abatement District. Currently, he is the owner of an insurance agency providing consumers throughout the state with property casualty and financial services products. And our final candidate is Mr. Rob Anderson. Mr. Anderson is the son of a 20-year career military father. His father played an integral role in developing his love of country, work ethic, and dedication to purpose. Mr. Anderson has worked in a variety of fields, including the print industry, construction, and geotechnical drilling. His roles have included all tiers of management and work in the field. His wife, he and his wife, Clarissa, have raised two children. Please help me welcome all our candidates to the stage. Now we begin with our opening statements. Candidates, you will have two minutes for your opening statements. Please let me remind you that we have a lot to cover tonight. So please be mindful of your time. There is a timer right in front of you. I will certainly give you the opportunity to complete your thought, but I will cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> so we start things off with Mr. Rob Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for that uh, gracious invitation. Now, one thing about the biography I have to point out, my mother is here in the crowd. I wasn't just the son of a father. I also had a mother, a very loving Texas Democrat, who uh, helped raise me and helped formulate my viewpoint of the world, and actually my more liberal side is probably because of her, which is probably why my campaign manager left it out of my biography, wanted me to appear centrist. My name is Rob Anderson. I'm a working class guy. I've been working for 35 years in various uh, industries, including, as he said, geotech drilling. So. Um, environmental sciences has been part of my life for the last seven or eight years. And uh, I decided to run for Congress because I think the uh, average working class person is underrepresented in Congress. No offense to our judges and lawyers and other politicians sitting here, but I'm just one of you, you know, but for a flip of the coin and a qualifying fee, I'm sitting up here instead of down there. Um, and that's it, and I'm looking forward to this debate, and I'm going to cut short so to speed things along. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Rader. Indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to uh, begin by thanking uh, Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana for the opportunity to be here with you this afternoon. Once again, my name is Larry Rader, and I am a candidate for the 3rd Congressional District for Congress. Tell you guys a little bit about myself. I was born in a very small community in 1971. I graduated from high school. I attended uh, uh, the Air Force in 1971. I'm a Vietnam era veteran. I served on a base called NKP Thailand, uh, in Thailand, uh, which was a CIA, CIA operation uh, into uh, North Vietnam. Uh, currently, I am a business person in New Iberia and have been for the last 30 years. I also served as uh, uh, a commissioner for the uh, Port of Iberia. I'm their past president as well. I also served the uh, on the board for Iberia Parish Mosquito Abatement, and I am uh, their past chairman as well. Uh, I've been working in the community diligently because I understand the needs, not only for us to have a secure future, but to make sure our, our air is clean, our water is clean. So one of the things that is very, very close and dear to my heart is to make sure that we move the third congressional district forward with clean, green energy. And I think as we go through this forum, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But I think we deserve that here in Louisiana to be able to have that. And I think that will be the solution to some of the, the problems that we face. Maybe it's too late. I, I'm not sure. But I know if we don't start, the situation is just going to get worse as uh, we continue forward. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Judge Methvin. Thank you, and thank you uh, to the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana and all the great work that you all are doing. Uh, it's a critical uh, issue, which is, of course, why we're here tonight. My name is Mimi Methvin. I'm a Democratic candidate for this congressional seat. I'm a native of Alexandria. I have a degree in philosophy from Tulane University. I worked my way through law school at Georgetown University while working full-time for Congressman Gillis Long. And, uh, 
very early on. Uh, that was in the era that John Bro had just been elected. Uh, Gillis Long mm. regularly hosted meetings of the congressional delegation, the Louisiana congressional delegation, in his office early in the morning when I was the only staff member there. Uh, I got to watch the Louisiana delegation work together across the aisle to address problems in Louisiana, and that was uh, my background there. I came back to Louisiana to become a federal prosecutor, and then in 1983 I became a United States Magistrate Judge uh, in Lafayette. Uh, I have been in Lafayette ever since then. It is my home. It's where I met my husband, raised my kids. Um, I want to mention that uh, my dad uh, had a hunting camp in Cameron Parish uh, for 50 years. He passed away of a heart attack a few days after Hurricane Rita wiped it off the map. My son, Connor, has worked for Concordia in New Orleans, uh, partnering with LA Safe, interviewing some of the first climate refugees in Louisiana at Ile de Saint Jean Char uh, Charles. So uh, we. I have been involved in coastal issues. Uh, as a judge, we hosted uh, annual uh, outings at the Rainy Wildlife Refuge for 15 years. Uh, so I knew Burton Leger, Lonnie Leger, who were uh, the managers at that time. So the coastal issues, I've been talking about them from the beginning of my campaign. It's a critical issue, and I look forward to speaking more to it tonight. Thank you very much, Judge Methvin. I want to remind everybody, please, to put your microphones close to your, to your mouth. Just a, just a reminder. And now, um, Mr. Guillory. Thank you, and good evening. Thank you to the coalition and to its partners for hosting this forum on probably the most or one of the most important issues as members and neighbors of South Louisiana that we could face. This is urgent. This is a bipartisan issue. This is not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's a Louisiana issue. It's an American issue, and it's an important issue, and I'm glad to be here. Again, my name is Josh Guillory. I'm running for Congress for many reasons, one of which is that our district deserves to have what we once had, and that is a true and adequate voice, especially on issues such as coastal restoration. You know, we deserve to be represented by someone who actually lives in the district. Right now, that's not the case, and I disagree with that. As you indicated, I am your neighbor in Lafayette Parish, a small business owner, a family law attorney for many years. Uh, I've served in the community as a volunteer middle school football coach. It's my passion. I'm also proud and humbled to be an Army veteran. I served in Iraq in 2005 as a cavalry officer. And before I was an officer, I was enlisted. And I enlisted because I felt called to do so. I feel that same calling right now to run for, for Congress out of this district at this time because I see what's going on in Washington. I see the debt out of control. I see our federal government grow into an unsustainable rate, and I see the quality of representation that we have, and with all due respect, I disagree with that. I know we can do better. As our congressman, I will fight vigorously to balance the federal budget, secure funding for key infrastructure projects within our district, protect our coast, and bring back the economic engine that we once had in this district. Again, this issue of coastal restoration, it is one of the most important issues we can face. As your congressman, there's not a day that goes by that I won't fight for every issue that is, that's important for this district, and coastal restoration is definitely high on my list. Thank you, and I ask for your support. Thank you all for your opening statements. We appreciate it. Before we get started with the fun part of our forum, I want to welcome everybody that is listening on KPEL. Uh, 96.5 FM in, La in the Lafayette area, and also all the folks that are watching worldwide at crcl.org. So we start our question and answer portion, and each one of you have one minute and 30 seconds to answer each question. We'll rotate who will start, and we begin things off with Mr. Rader. And the first question is short, sweet, and to the point. Okay. And it is, what do you think are the most critical coastal issues facing the 3rd Congressional District today? Yeah, and that, that's a very good question. Uh, I think the uh, biggest issue facing uh, the 3rd Congressional District is uh, land loss. I think it's, uh, it's to the point where uh, something must be done. We, don't, we really don't have a choice at this point. So one of the reasons why I am so energetic about green energy is because of the fact that if we utilize green energy, we'll be putting less carbon into our atmosphere. Less the carbon is what's causing global warming. Now, we've got uh, at least access to three universities within uh, a stone's throw of the 3rd Congressional District. Um, if I would become your congressman, one of the things that I would propose is that we utilize those uh, three universities. And uh, along, working along with uh, scientists and, and engineers, I'm not a scientist and I'm not an engineer, 
But I do know that uh, from Washington, I would be willing to support whatever we come up with locally as a solution to our massive land loss. And so I would, I would first spearhead probably a task force to look at maybe a carbon tax, something that would create the funding that's necessary in order for us to be able to solve some of the problems that we are facing here in Louisiana. Without the money, we can't do very much, and a carbon tax will help us to move in that direction to a solution. If we don't find a solution soon, we may not be leaving, uh, living here ourselves. We may have to leave and, and move farther north. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Judge Methvin. Um, I think we all recognize the um, urgency of uh, the problems that we're facing, and I think what what I see as the problem is that we are in an era of political gridlock and we're facing a crisis that requires urgent action and it also requires people, uh, different stakeholders to come together and to come to agreement. We have, Louisiana is on the front lines of this, this global challenge. We have the ability to become world leaders in uh, coastal protection and in uh, addressing uh, storm protection issues, uh, sea level rise challenges. We have the expertise in Louisiana. We simply need to be empowered to be leaders. I've been speaking from the beginning of my campaign uh, after, after talking to people at town halls uh, about uh, full federal funding of our coastal master plan, not at the $50 billion level, but at the $100 billion level, and maybe even higher. But uh, we currently have an administration and a representative who believes uh, in the dogma we've been living with for 30 or 40 years, that government is bad and only corporations and uh, wealthy interests are good. We've got to have a federal approach, federal backing to empower Louisiana to help address this challenge and allow us to export our uh, innovation to other places around the world that are facing the same challenge. Thank you, Judge Methvin. Mr. Guillory. I also agree that land loss is definitely the, the biggest issue in this regard. Um, you know, but the way we're looking at it right now, when we attack these projects and when we go and, and uh, start to implement some of the ideas and, and, and create these solutions, we're looking at it from a Band-Aid perspective and not, not from a larger picture. You know, take the, um, the Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge, for example. You know, that, that's, it, it's a great project, but addressing three miles off of our coast when the coast of Louisiana is roughly 400 miles is not going to do it. We have to look at this as a large-scale restoration. We need to get buy-in, not just from our other delegates, which I believe we will have. And as our congressman, you know, my job is to go and, and fight for the resources that we have to actually implement these ideas. There, there are several ideas out there. This coalition has done a ton of research that, that uh, if we implement those ideas would work. So as a, as a rep, I don't claim to know the, the technology. I don't, I'm not a civil engineer. I know what I don't know, but I know what I do know, and I know I care. I know I care about this issue. And as your rep, I would form first a coalition of my own, and that's with our delegation in Louisiana. I would move to the delegation in Alabama and Mississippi. And if we can pull in uh, support from our, our friends in Texas as well to do, it as, to do this and have a stronger and larger voice in Washington, we can then look at this at a larger scale and not just three miles at a time, five miles at a time. We need to look at this issue as as a Gulf Coast region issue. We can do it, and I will lead the charge in Washington as our rep. Thank you, Mr. Guillory. Guillory. Mr. Anderson. Okay. Uh, this is probably where I'll, I'll sound a bit different than uh, my colleagues. We know what the problem is, and so far we're getting a lot of political answers um, because that's what we're used to. The, the problem is that we're losing land, and we know how to fix it, and we don't. Why not? Um, we have an Army Corps of Engineers. We have people capable, people capable of stopping this encroachment of land being lost. I was standing outside uh, before this event and talking to a local uh, resident whose land is being encroached right now over the last eight years and the water is lapping up at his doorstep. And I asked, why isn't the Army Corps of Engineers dredging right now to save that land? because we have a government that likes to talk about things instead of doing it. And that's where my construction background is probably a bit different. While other people are arguing about how to fix the problem, I generally like to go fix the problem, um, which is going to be different in the House of Representatives with 435 members and a 
hundred people in the Senate, and a lot of them like to talk, as as you can tell. Um, <laughs> so it is a problem, and we do need uh, you know a Gulf Coast solution. Um, there are other coalitions that already exist among all the Gulf states to put solutions together, but I think. Pretty soon we're going to see our land disappearing and then the time for talking will be done because we'll be on to the next thing. As Mr. Rader said, we'll be moving north. Thank you all for those very thoughtful answers. Our next question revolves around restoration projects slated for this area. Ms. Methman, you will be first to answer this one. The Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, or CPRA, is in the process of engineering and designing a major hydrological restoration project known as the Calcasieu Ship Channel Salinity Control Measures Project. This is a critical cornerstone project for the coastal region, which will control saltwater intrusion through the Calcasieu Ship Channel into Calcasieu Lake and the adjacent wetlands. How will you support the forward momentum of this project? Judge Methvin. Thank you. Uh, so this is a, a great project, very well needed project to protect the wetlands and vegetation and also to uh, make sure that navigation in the chip, ship channel uh, continues uh, unabated. Uh, it's a, a big economic driver in, in this region. Uh, but just like uh, many, many other projects, the challenge is going to be to make sure that adequate funding is there and that the project continues to go forward. Um, as I talk to people around the district to uh, one, one issue that keeps coming up is that um, although many, many of these projects uh, are important, they have an important uh, function in their region, we have got to look at this as a regional and maybe a statewide problem as well. We have to make sure that uh, the, the funding level does continue. Right now, the, uh, the projects that we have have very uh, unreliable funding. We don't know what we're gonna get from GoMesa from year to year. We don't know what we're gonna get from uh, other funding levels. And so to secure that, that funding and to keep these projects going forward is gonna be uh, one of the biggest challenges. As uh, when I left the bench in 2009, I opened a private mediation firm because this is one of the things that I believe in is getting people to the table that can come up with solutions. And that's what I intend to do as uh, your representative in this district. Thank you. Mr. Guillory. All right. It's my understanding that the salinity problem is really nothing more than a push and pull of salt water and fresh water. As we have our salt water being pushed up from the south, heading north, we, have our, we need our fresh water to push that down uh, further, further south, the salt water. Um, again, I'm not a civil engineer, but I know that the, the answers to local issues lie heavily on our local leaders. And as our federal representative, I will build a partnership not only with my coalition, as I indicated in my last answer, but a partnership with our police juries, with our council members, with any local leader, local businesses, and see the resources we need to actually combat this. My job, my piece of the puzzle, is to fight for the resources to make these good ideas happen. We all agree we want to protect our coast. We all agree we want to restore our coast. I'm telling you, as our next rep, it is one of my highest, my, one of my highest priorities. But I, I, while I may not know civil engineering, I do know how to fight. I know how to fight respectfully. I know how to fight effectively. I fight for families every day. As a family law attorney, I fight for children. And I often joke, but I'm serious when I say this, if I can sit in a room with two people that once loved each other, and we can talk about community property and children and custody, and we can come up with a solution, I am heavily confident that I can go to Washington and speak to my co uh, colleagues in Congress to come up with a solution to protect our coast. Again, this is not a Louisiana issue. It affects us more at a, at a, a, a disproportionate rate. But it's a, it's a nation issue, it's a national issue, it's definitely a regional issue, and I know we can get support to get the resources we need to fight these issues. Thank you, Mr. Guillory. Mr. Anderson. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, from my understanding of the uh, Calcasieu uh, dredging project, it's uh, projected at around, if my memory serves, around 240 million with 160 for maintenance costs, or it could be 260 and 140. Anyway, the total is about $400 million, which sounds like a lot when you're in a little region. Um, and I believe it was earmarked to be paid for from fines from oil companies, which is 
a lovely use of uh, the fines for uh, oil spills and whatnot, but we need to free up funding, um, as, as uh, Judge Methvin uh, pointed out, from uh, Gomesa, the, the cap where we pay into a national fund, the Gulf states, and you know there's a 12 and a half percent cap on uh, payments coming back. And I think if you, again, just disentangle the bureaucracy, we can address these. You know the plans are in place. The civil engineers have already drawn up the the paperwork, and they've already looked at what we need to do to address the saltwater intrusion. And it's basically just untangle the bureaucracy and say this money is produced by the Gulf states. It should be spent in the Gulf states to protect. You know, we we produce 25% uh, of the country's petroleum comes through down here. So one would think that it is a national priority and not just a district one. And we're paying into a national fund, and you know that money's not coming back, and it should. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Rader. Well, certainly we we having a problem here in in Lake Charles uh, with uh, saltwater intrusion, but not only here in Lake Charles. Uh, Several other areas throughout the district is experiencing that same problem. I'm going to share with you uh, uh, some information regarding uh, uh, Grand Isle, which was a project, uh, Elmer Island Beach, Elmer's Island Beach. They spent some, uh, some over $200 uh, million dollars trying to repair Elmer Island Beach, which they did a very, very good job creating uh, more beach from sand off the Gulf of Mexico. And, it, and it's beautiful there. It's protecting the... Uh, uh, wildlife is protecting the fisheries and uh, and also is acting as a barrier for saltwater intrusion into the island. However, that 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 project, although uh, the money was spent, I don't expect it's going to last very long, because uh, water is a powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing when it's uh, especially during a hurricane. Uh, so so when I look at the problems that we're experiencing in this district, I know it's a local problem. I know it's a state problem. I know it's a national problem, but it's also a global problem. And so at some point in time, we have to understand that it's going to take all of us, every state in the United States and every country in the world to get together and lower the amount of carbon that we are placing in our atmosphere. We deserve to have clean air and clean water. So we're having a detrimental effect on our lifestyle. What type of lifestyle are we going to leave for our kids in the future? You know, our polar caps are melting, ice and sea levels are rising. So we have to do something or it's just going to continue to get worse. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Thank you all. Now let's turn our attention to the National Flood Insurance Program. Mr. Guillory, you get first crack. All right. Well, let me ask you the question. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, throughout the United States, the dangers associated with high rain events causing widespread flooding in communities that have never flooded before is becoming evident. Louisiana had widespread flooding in 2016 that caused over $10 billion in property damages in 21 parishes. At the same time, the National Flood Insurance Program is on its seventh short-term extension and hasn't undergone a full reauthorization with needed reforms in five years. What, in your view, needs to change about this program to make it more successful? Well, first, let's, let's go back in time a little bit, fall of 2016. You know, I remember pulling some sheetrock out of my brother-in-law's house, my, several of my friends' house, their parents' house. Um, I live in Lafayette Parish, and I know my, my friends here in Calcasieu and Cameron, you're no different. You felt those floods too. You were hit either directly or indirectly. And as a community, again, it's not a, it's not a Democrat or Republican issue on this, but we came together and we got through it. We're Americans. We'll get through that stuff. But it's hurt. It hurt. And it's hurting. And we're still hurting now. And I find it inconceivable, inexcusable to have a congressman that tells us that he cares about us and then goes to Washington and votes to increase flood insurance premiums on a district that was hit so hard back in just 2016. Now, the National Flood Insurance Program is broken. You know, right now the federal government is controlling flood insurance premiums. I fundamentally disagree with that. I know we can't change this overnight. I know we can't snap our fingers and fix this. But as our congressman, I would like to find ways where we can transition into a private sector-led industry. I trust the private sector far more than I trust the federal government. And the private sector is in a much better position to allocate risk than bureaucrats in Washington. We don't like universal health care. 
well, we shouldn't accept universal flood care. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guillory. Mr. Anders. Uh, thank you. Um, now, this is, as, uh, as, as Mr. Guillory pointed out, this is a bipartisan, actually, it's a nonpartisan issue. Right. It's a resident issue. Right. Uh, we all face this. And matter of fact, the flood insurance did just get another uh, temporary extension by Congress through November. Um, and uh, recently had for, uh, forgiven $16 billion in debt that the National Flood Insurance Program uh, owed to the Treasury Department. So from this, we can, we can take that it's, it's definitely a hot mess. We know this. Um, it's, there's real risk of people like in, here in Louisiana that we live on the coast. And insurance companies, and this is where I disagree with Mr. Guillory, is where regulation comes in. Insurance companies don't want to pay insurance. They want to collect insurance premiums. And so if the free market decided it in and of itself without government intervention, we would have no insurance here in Louisiana. They would basically say, well, when your house is uh, washed away, then, you know, move north. So um, we do need uh, the government to basically regulate that uh, national flood insurance program to make sure that homeowners in Louisiana are protected. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Rader. Yeah, that, that is a good question, and it, it bears uh, an opportunity for us to look at uh, the past and see where we are going into the future. Uh, insurance on your, your flood insurance is based on your, what they call a base flood elevation. So that base flood elevation determines what you pay for, for insurance. Now, as your sea level rises, so does your base flood elevation falls lower as the sea level rises. So your, your price, and if you've noticed, more and more areas are slowly starting to fall into a flood zone. And the reason it's falling into that flood zone is because of the fact that water is not draining out like it once was because your sea level is high. The National Insurance uh, Flood Insurance Program is a national program. The, uh, the insurance companies administer that program, and, and we are write the checkout, but uh, and we are collect the premium. But we we do not uh, control that program. It's being controlled by us, the government. So, in order to solve that problem, that's why I said this is a national problem, a local problem, it's a state problem, but more importantly, it's a global problem, and we need to start taking. Uh, very good notice of what's happening with our climate because that's the key to it and that's why it's so important that green energy, clean energy can help us move forward in the future and create good paying jobs. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Judge Method. So the National Flood Insurance Program is one example of uh, a, a piece of this problem that is very complicated and has a lot of aspects that, that we have to take into consideration. So uh, my understanding is it's $25 billion in debt. Uh, it is a, uh, a mess. There are one of the problems is that we have developers and lenders that are using uh, very outdated FEMA maps that don't accurately reflect the risk of flooding in various zones. Uh, innocent people who are uh, basically um, uh, build in these areas uh, not knowing any better, uh, and when they are flooded and they have, uh, they have the backing of the NFIP, uh, we've got to take into consideration the, the dilemma that they're in. We have to address this from, from various um, angles. We have to require that uh, FEMA maps, updated FEMA maps be used. We have to acknowledge the uh, rate and the level of sea level rise, the causes of sea level rise. We need to address that with political courage. Uh, the United States needs to rejoin the Paris Climate Accords. We need to address, uh, fully fund our coastal challenges. And I think our representative needs to build a coalition with other representatives around the United States where they're experiencing these same problems. Uh, New York, Cal the Carolinas, California, et cetera. So. Thank you, Judge Methvin. Thank you all. Now let's tackle a question about non-structural flood risk reduction. We're back to the top of the rotation. Mr. Anderson, you'll start off this time. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has developed the Southwest Coastal Louisiana Feasibility Study, which will provide non-structural hurricane and storm surge damage risk reduction. 
measures in Calcasieu, Cameron, and Vermilion parishes. Non-structural solutions, which can include voluntary buyouts, structure elevation, and flood proofing have been shown to provide the greatest cost savings in reducing the cost of damages after disasters. Yet flood, uh, excuse me, let yet federal funds for advancing these solutions have always been limited. The question is, how do you think the importance of these measures could be elevated? Uh, this is probably the time to talk about the, the, the gorilla in the room, climate change. Um, we are still in a position where it has not been officially recognized by the current administration at the highest levels that climate change is occurring. Or they argue about whether it is or not, um, not that, uh, and whether it's man-made or not, not uh, whether it is or not, I'm sorry. Uh, the point being that we know uh, the scientific consensus that climate change is occurring. Sea levels are rising. There is melting in Antarctica and Greenland. This is happening. It doesn't matter at this point to me if it's man-made or not. I happen to be, uh, you know, I happen to like science and data. So I'm, I'm going along with the scientists say that man has something to do with it. So as Mr. Rader has pointed out, a carbon tax is one of the options. There are many ways to pay for it. But first we have to as, get our government to agree that, you know, our backyards are flooding. You know, this is actually happening. Stop arguing that it isn't. And then uh, we don't have to pay as much money for FEMA to clean up the mess afterwards because we're doing preventative measures ahead of time. Sorry, I used almost all of my time criticizing Trump without criticizing <laughs> Trump. Um, so yes, the federal government does need to work together. Uh, representatives from this district do need to work to admit that the world is changing and we need to address it. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Rader. Yeah, well, I, I agree uh, that uh, basically what we have been doing for the last few years is placing a Band-Aid on a wound that's not gonna heal and it's gonna to continue to deteriorate. You will continue to deteriorate. Sea levels are gonna to continue to rise. The temperatures are gonna to continue to rise. Hurricanes are gonna become stronger. Uh, flood insurance is gonna to continue to go up. And so, you know, when people talk about a tax, it, it sort of makes them a little scary. But you're gonna pay for this one way or the other. We all are going to pay. So at some point in time, you know, I, I think we do need to put a Band-Aid on something for a short period of time, but then we need to address the real problem. And within that problem, from a business standpoint, when I look at a problem, I always think of an opportunity. And I think Louisiana is standing at a threshold of a, of a wonderful opportunity to lead the rest of the world lead the rest of the world with clean, green energy. Something that you can be proud of, something that we know how to, to accomplish, and we could solve so many problems, not only here, but throughout the world. We can become the leader, we can be first in something. So here's an opportunity for us, and, and I'm hoping, as your congressman, that uh, you will stand with me to take advantage of that opportunity as we move forward. Judge Methvin. So when we had a town hall in, uh, in Delcom uh, recently, uh, as you drive up and down the streets, you see so many of the homes that have been elevated. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of people have left, uh, left Delcom, moved to Youngsville. They were flooded there as well. Um, there was an example, I think a house in Delcom that was originally uh, $25,000 that it cost $140,000 to elevate. So there are some real uh, dilemmas here about um, how to live with water, uh, how to uh, decide when we abandon our cultural areas, uh, if that is going to be necessary. These are heartbreaking problems that we have to address. Um, as a, a U.S. magistrate judge, when we had very difficult problems, uh, oftentimes the p parties would agree, and I would encourage them, uh, let us convene in the courtroom on a day. You bring your experts. Uh, each side brings their experts. Each side brings their 
uh, uh, the person that makes decisions for their company or that family, and we're going to look at the problem, ask questions back and forth in a respectful way, and come up with a solution that is a win-win solution where we can find common ground. And this is the kind of process that we need to engage in now so that we make sure we come up with the best solutions uh, for the most number of people. Thank you. And Mr. Gillery. So I believe the question was regarding non-structural flood protection. Um, you know, as, as far as non-structural remedies that they go, of course, we can, there's several of them. We could look into elevating houses and things like that. Um, I know I say this a lot, but I, I, I have to continue to remind. Uh, and no one on this panel knows as much as the coalition does on, on this topic. No one knows as much as our scientists do on this topic, our civil engineers. But again, what is our piece of the puzzle when we go to Washington? And the piece of the puzzle for a representative is to go and fight for the resources that we need to address the issues. Now, it's my understanding that most of the protection is structural or mechanical. You know, we put a barrier up, we pump the salt water out, and we put and we try to restore land. At, at the most simplistic form, that's that's kind of where we're going with restoring our coast. As a federal rep, I, I like that idea, and I want to fight for it. Now, these things cost money. I'm an advocate, a strong advocate, to balancing the budget, but we can do both. Right now, you know, our national debt is over $21 trillion. That's inexcusable. We can do better. We're going to pay interest. Let me put this in perspective. We're going to pay interest on our public debt this year at a rate of about $310 billion. I would much rather pay down our debt which makes our interest rates go down, and use the money to restore our coasts as opposed to paying countries like China and other countries in the world that aren't always so friendly to America. Thank you all. I think you've all talked about collaboration in some form or fashion, and this is your opportunity to elaborate on that a little bit. And we start with you, Mr. Rader. It is important that the Louisiana congressional delegation work together to ensure that funding is directed to Louisiana to restore our coast and that current funding streams are protected. How will you work with the rest of the delegation to ensure that Louisiana's interests are protected and that we have the resources needed to restore the coast? Yeah, absolutely, that's, a, that's another good question. And, and I think uh, the, the past experiences that I bring to the table in so far as uh, uh, being a president for the Port of Iberia, working with the coalition that's currently in Washington and the one previous to that. Uh, working with people is what I do. That's, that's basically what my business is all about. Uh, regardless to who you are, you know, I, I will work with you until the very end. And I think that's what we need. And, but we also need to move forward with uh, accepting the fact that we are where we are standing. We are in a situation now where it's almost, as far as I'm concerned, do or die. And we need leadership. That's what good leadership is all about. Someone to say, hey, listen, let's look at this problem. Let's get some people involved in it. And let's find out what the solution is. I, I, I think as, uh, as voters, I think as residents of, of this uh, great state, you depend upon your leaders to guide you to make the proper choices and the proper decisions. And if we just sit on a back burner and we do nothing and we say, okay, well, here, here you go. This is your problem, and that problem continues to persist in the long run, is gonna cost you more. So my thing is, is that we, we can solve this problem, we can solve it together, but we also got to look at this problem from a global standpoint, working even with uh, people from other countries in order to solve the problems that we have. Judge Methvin. Uh, I understand that there is a caucus in Congress <laughs> started by Representative uh, Steve Scalise that addresses uh, Gulf coastal issues. There's also a general uh, caucus on coastal issues that in involve representatives from uh, California, New York, uh, other places, other states around the country that are also experiencing sea level rise and coastal uh, land loss. I think they have uh, tidal flooding uh, on a regular basis in Boston. This is an issue that is affecting the world. And again, there's no place uh, 
that has more challenges on so many levels than Louisiana. So uh, my plan is to work across the aisle uh, and uh, with my fellow Democrats. Uh, I believe the House is going to flip blue in, uh, in November, and I will be part of that uh, Democratic majority. But I, uh, as a professional mediator and a person who uh, observed our congressional delegation working across the aisle uh, when I was in law school, uh, my plan is to reach out uh, create those relationships, talk about these issues, uh, and come to a, uh, a, a, a way that we can work together uh, to help Louisiana, let Louisiana be the leader in this challenge and export our expertise around the world. Thank you. Mr. Gilroy. Well, red, blue, rainbow, it doesn't matter what, what kind of wave is out there. This is a bipartisan, it should be a bipartisan issue. It is our coast. And as our representative, I will fight for legislation, legislation, bipartisan legislation that outlasts any kind of wave, Republican wave, Democrat wave, it doesn't matter. This is our coast, all of our coast, and we need to look at it on a large scale restoration concept. We can't continue to put Band-Aids. We can't say this is a Cameron Parish issue because addressing it just in Cameron Parish is not going to effectively address the issues in Cam Cameron Parishes to the extent that we are able to do it or maximize our, our capabilities. We have to look at it at a larger scale. So first, it starts with gaining, gaining all of the support for our delegation. We're, you know, that one voice turns into six voices. We have, we're so blessed in Louisiana to have leadership in our delegation with Steve Scalise st serving as our whip, possibly even our speaker, because I believe we're going to maintain the house. <laughs> <laughs> but we also have Cedric Richmond's head of the Black Caucus and those are two leaders two leadership positions that are powerful and I understand that 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 you know, reaching across the aisle is more than just talking, it's about doing. And on this issue, we can do this, but we've got to build our coalition past Louisiana. We have to build our coalition with Alabama and Mississippi, and I'm convinced we can get members of the Texas delegation to join in with this fight. And sooner or later, that, that one voice out of the third congressional district turned into six, turned into multiple voices, and, and, and we have strength. This is our coast. This is our Louisiana. Thank you, sir. Mr. Anderson. All right, uh, uh, bipartisanship cooperation. This is this is my specialty. This is my field. Um, the, to give it a, a little political insight, what y'all may not know is that we all kind of know each other because we've all been debating for months. We all get along backstage, and I'm the one who uh, generally, you know, deprecates himself enough to be the comic foil backstage. And, uh, and I'd use this opportunity as bipartisan cooperation to acknowledge uh, Verone Thomas, who is a candidate for Congress, who is here in the audience, but was not uh, invited to this forum because he's a jerk, but, you know. <laughs> um, that is not the case. I'm kidding. That part is a joke. Uh, but that's what I mean. We all, we all do get along, and I think a lot of times the uh, our opposing viewpoints make it seem like we're at polar opposites but you know Josh and I get along Mimi and I get along Larry and I get along Verone and I get along so bipartisan cooperation means just treating the other person with respect uh, acknowledging their points of views and coming together to use statementship or whatever you would like to label it as to do what's best for the people of the third district of Louisiana and that's all that bipartisanship is, is stop putting party before country. You know, we're all Americans, we're all Louisianans, none of us want our houses to be underwater, let's get to that. Thank you all very much. We've made it through five of our eight questions, all and right. we're learning a great deal. What's that? That's it, all right? All right, yeah, yeah <laughs> just making sure I didn't miss them. I was being um, your cheerleader. So we're learning a great deal, for sure. Um, our sixth question will begin with Judge Methvin. And it deals with innovative funding mechanisms for coastal projects. Each year, Louisiana coastal parishes receive money through the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, or GOMESIM, to be used for coastal restoration and storm protection projects. Cameron Parish was the first parish in the state to bond out its uh, GOMESA, re, uh, GOMESA revenues excuse me, to fund coastal projects, a move that is likely to be repeated in other coastal parishes across the state. What do you think the best measures are for the parishes to advance critical coastal protection projects, and how will you, in Congress, support these efforts? Judge Smith. 
So the bonding approach is uh, a great solution to the problem of needing money now for projects that uh, if, if you wait too long, uh, their uh, utility is going to go by the wayside. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a great approach. Uh, but as I mentioned before, um, none of the funding sources that we currently have for our coastal uh, master plan are reliable or long-term. The Go Mesa funds uh, were proposed to be uh, removed a couple of times. They dodged the, bu the bullet. Um, but we already know that at a $50 billion level, which is the minimal funding level for the master plan, uh, we're going to have a huge amount of net land loss. Um, and that is why I'm advocating for full federal partnership at the $100 billion level so that we have a dedicated, reliable funding source to allow Louisiana to address these challenges. And one thing that we haven't talked about yet is the number of jobs that this is going to bring to uh, Louisiana. I think the number, uh, if at the $100 billion level, is, is 212,000 uh, jobs with uh, $7 billion injected into the economy. Uh, to uh, to uh, fill these jobs, we also need to make sure that we are addressing education and workforce issues, and that's another aspect of this that that I'm dedicated to um, to addressing. Thank you, Judge Method, Mr. Gillery. I'll piggyback off of what uh, Mimi said about Go Mesa. You're right; it was almost it was almost gutted, and it's my understanding that it took the leadership of Steve Scalise and Senator Cassidy to to make sure that that wasn't the case. And I'm highlighting that because those, that's two examples of leadership, two examples of quality leadership, of putting the needs of constituents over the needs of the parties. You know, our, our current incumbent, and I, again, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative, but I, I'm challenging an incumbent Republican. And I know that he touts a lot about it. I'm voting with the president, so high percentage. Look, it's not enough to vote Republican. It's not enough to vote with the president. We're not going there to, to represent a party. Again, I happen to be a conservative. I happen to believe that, that we know the answers for ourselves, and local leaders know the answers to local issues far greater than the federal government. But we're going there, and I will go there to represent the citizens of Cameron, Calcasieu, and all nine parishes and precincts in St. Landry Parish. And it's the needs of, of our community that weighs heavily on my heart and on my mind and what I'll be fighting for. Now, we can get the funding that's needed. You know, I know Go Mesa and, and the settlement for the BPO oil spill is, is a good resource. If that's inadequate, if my local leaders are telling me that that's inadequate, then I'm going to go fight for the funding to, to, to uh, forge that gap. And we can do it by balancing the federal budget, balance it to a surplus. We shouldn't have to make these decisions. The coast is not a bipartisan. That's off the table. It's a bipartisan issue. It's not a partisan issue, and we can do it. Balance the budget to a surplus, prepare a coast. Thank you, sir. Mr. Anderson. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. You were the specific question was the, whether the, we supported the the bonding to supplement Go Mesa. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. If there's a, if there's a the, the actual question was the best way for for parishes to advance critical protection, coastal protection, to make sure that um, that that they can do it as okay. quickly as fastly as possible. Okay. Thank you. Um, the the reason being, you know, from two different radical answer so far, I, I'd forgotten what the actual question was. Um, yes, I, I do, uh, I am a firm believer in infrastructure being done with public-private partnerships. Um, corporations live here just like people, and according to the Citizens United decision in the Supreme Court, corporations are people, so they should probably pay some of the burden. Um, I am a believer in bonds being issued to ensure that if the, I mean, the, the, the damage needs to be fixed, the protections need to be put into place. This absolutely must be the case. And I am not in favor of raising taxes to do so, but I am in favor of whatever we have to do, whatever emergency measures need to be done to ensure that this, uh, you know, uh, Gomez of the bipartisan cross-coastal coalition is allowed to execute the uh, protections and needs for our coastal regions. Bonds are a, a perfectly viable example as long as they're not accompanied by an accompanying tax increase, which is not a very liberal thing to say, but I'm rather a centrist, so what are you going to do? Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Mr. Rader. Yeah, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Senator Mary Landrieu, who was instrumental 
and uh, helping us to uh, form GOMESA, which is Gulf of Mexico. That's an acronym for Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act. And the way it was originally set up, it was divvied up 37.5% is to be divided among four states, the first portion, which will go to coastal restoration. And then 12.5% of those revenues was to be dispersed to land and water conservation fund. So that fund uh, currently is uh, still being collected from offshore royalties. It's coming in uh, whenever there's uh, oil coming into the Louisiana coastline. That amount of oil, uh, we receive some revenue from that oil. So that's what GoMesa is all about, if you guys were wondering about that. But let me say this to you, and I'm gonna sort of go kind of on a, a little far tangent here. Recently, there was a tax that was passed, a $3 trillion tax that was passed to that 1% at the top. So when we start talking about balancing the budget and we start talking about some of the things that we need to do, $3 trillion with a T, we need to make ourselves aware of the fact that those individuals at the top probably don't need to have a $3 trillion tax passed on us, the American people. So we could start there with uh, utilizing some of that money to help restore our coastline and do some of the other things that we need because ultimately Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and even VA benefits are gonna be uh, affected by this $3 trillion tax. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Down to our final two questions, everyone. Mr. Guillory, you start first on this one. The state of Louisiana faces a steep fiscal cliff in 15 years when funding from Deepwater Horizon damages peters out, and yet we still need billions of dollars to meet the needs of the Coastal Master Plan. This time Horizon is longer than most politicians and agencies' heads spend in office. What do you believe needs to be done today to address the long-term need that we have? First, let's start taking the long-term uh, approach seriously because because everything you mentioned is is spot on in my opinion we have to start looking this obviously on a large scale from implementation but we have to look at the long run that that money from BP the BP oil settlement is not going to be here forever as you indicated that's why we don't need to wait five years from now we don't need to wait ten years from now just like we don't need to wait five or ten years to start implementing some of the ideas we have the technology we have the technology, this coalition, if you go to their website, and I promise they didn't pay me to give them a, a, a plug, but it, it really is, it's, it's fantastic. They've done a great job, uh, and there's other, other organizations out here that have, that have made it known to us, and, and we have the answers, let's do it. You know, we put three men on the moon in 1969, I am confident that we can restore our coast in Louisiana. Um, now, Mr. Rader, you had mentioned about the, in, in a, I guess, inequality of the taxes. Uh, and, and, you know, I hear this often. I hear this from, from my, my fellow opponents here, my fellow candidates. Um, and, and even Congressman Higgins will, will say the problem to the deficit is, is revenue. Revenue, revenue, revenue. We don't have a revenue problem in Washington. We have a spending problem in Washington, and I don't understand why we continue to say this. We continue to talk about the deficit and the debt, and we can't have a balanced budget. It's been 18, 19 years since we've done that, since we did that. We can do this. We can balance the budget. We can balance to a surplus. We can have the money. We can start talking about long-term solutions about our coast, and we can do all of that now, and that's what I'll advocate for as our next representative. Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on, uh, I agree with Mr. Uh, Guillory, we do have a spending problem, but I will add on that we probably also have a, a revenue problem. It's probably both. As Mr. Rader pointed out, with the recent tax cut, cut huge amounts of revenue coming in from the upper 1%, and then now they're looking at Social Security and Medicare and uh, various other entitlement programs, which are entitlements in the original sense that you're entitled to them. You paid into them your entire life. They aren't a gift from Washington. So Washington does have a spending problem, but it also has a revenue problem. You can't take in less tax revenue and then spend the same amount. You, you know, we see that in our current uh, budget deficit. And I'm afraid I haven't addressed your question at all. So could, could you? Uh, well, well, the question is, we, we're, we're about to, in 15 years, we're not going to have that Deepwater Horizon money anymore. Right. How do we okay. fill that gap? Oh, okay. Well, then uh, I'll briefly touch. I have about 30 seconds left. Um, part of the legislation my campaign is proposing is an infrastructure package along the Gulf region. And part of that infrastructure is protecting the environment so that we have a Gulf Coast to have a coalition so that we're not underwater in, you know, 20 years 
um, infrastructure based on federally backed bonds so that let Wall Street invest in Louisiana. If we upgrade our healthcare, our infrastructure, and our education, it will become a more attractive place to live. All of that is moot if we don't exist because the Atlantic Ocean is now in Oklahoma. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rader. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, Louisiana has provided the nation with the infrastructure in order for it to achieve the status it achieved at this point. Uh, we've got trucks, we've got cars, we've got highways, byways, waterways. Louisiana is the energy producer. We've provided America with heating, we've provided America with cooling. It's only fair that they help us to get our coastline back in order because they are benefiting from it. Not just us, but the entire nation. And so that's why when I talk about a carbon tax, I think it's so important that we understand that we have provided so much to this nation. They should give a little bit back, just a little bit, at least to save our coastline. And a carbon tax will do that because it will be passed on to those individuals, not only just here in Louisiana, but throughout the nation. The other thing is, is by moving forward with clean, green energy, it's gonna create nothing but jobs here. Every home that you see, that we put a solar panel, somebody's gonna to have to put it up there, somebody's gonna to have to build it, somebody is gonna to have to design it. And so we could utilize the infrastructure that we currently have to stimulate our economy, create good jobs, and someone, some scientists I think somewhere had said that there are, there's more money in clean energy providing jobs to Louisiana than there is in the oil industry. So we, that's something we need to think about. I think that's the only way for Louisiana to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Judge Methley. So I think one of the issues, or the issue that is the elephant in the room tonight, is the responsibility of the oil and gas industry for the loss of our coast, uh, our wetlands. And um, as Mr. Rader said, Louisiana has uh, stood with the country for, for decades in providing affordable energy. Uh, we have also stood with the oil and gas industry for decades, and it's time for the oil and gas industry to step up and accept its responsibility. I think their own studies indicate that they are responsible for 35% of the loss of our coastal wetlands. Uh, government studies indicate that number is more is closer to 65%. Uh, I think we can agree the number is probably somewhere in between. Uh, when we look at the billions and billions of dollars that we're going to need to uh, protect our coast uh, and to restore it and to make sure we're not losing another 2,800 uh, 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 miles of our coast in the next 50 years, we need to uh, acknowledge that this is a responsible party and uh, we all learned in kindergarten uh, to take responsibility for the damage that we do. So. Uh, that is an issue I think that needs to be acknowledged and, and spoken about. Right now, I think what, what's happening is we're getting a, uh, a, a, a delay game in the coastal lawsuits, and um, I believe it's time for the oil and gas industry to step up. Thank you all very much, and we have reached our final question of the evening. As Kim mentioned in her earlier remarks, solving Louisiana's land loss crisis will take unprecedented leadership, coordination, and political will. This question gets right to the heart of that. We start off with you, Mr. Anderson. The most pessimistic sea level rise projections show that southeast, excuse me, southwest coastal Louisiana could experience six feet of sea level rise by 2100. Scientists believe that we only have about two decades to act before sea level rise begins to increase dramatically. With these projections, some areas may be too costly to save and limited federal funds will need to be allocated to areas of critical national importance. As a representative, how would you make these tough decisions and advocate for the third district while also being a good steward of these limited federal funds? Wow, no pressure. <laughs> okay, uh, how would I save Louisiana or let it go into the sea? <laughs> I don't know how that falls to me. Um, as a representative of the third district, I think the first um, the key to the whole issue is to acknowledge that this is actually happening. We are facing drastic sea level rises and 
there are those of us who are campaigning on the fact that we are aware that this is happening and we want everybody to be prepared for any emergency measures that might need to be taken. And yes, there might be some districts that are too uh, far gone to be saved and then we start, um, like any sort of uh, triage that needs to be done, you have to look at what you can save, the cost to benefit analysis. You get a good legislation team, a good uh, scientific team. You actually follow scientific data um, when you, and not to knock Republicans, but I think Democrats are a little better at looking at scientific data and not asking whether or not it's free market scientific data, but rather it's academic. And you follow that scientific data and you realize what you can save, what is, uh, doesn't cost billions of dollars uh, to save a square mile, but to what is best for the, the state as a whole. And, you know, tough decisions are part of leadership. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rader. Yeah, well, I, I think we need to use to some degree the uh, Band-Aid approach to save some of those lands that may be uh, lost if we don't do anything. But uh, an Elmer Island Beach is a perfect example of a Band-Aid as far as I'm concerned. And, if you guys are not familiar with it, you need to look it up and Google it and uh, familiar, familiarize yourself with it in Grand Isle. I think it was a perfect uh, Band-Aid solution. It's not going to last forever, but it'll give us some time. It'll give us some time to make the decisions that we need to make so we can form the proper coalitions, not only here in Louisiana, not only in the nation, but globally. It's so important that we maintain relationships with other countries, relationships that where people can understand how important it is that this is the only planet we have, and once we mess this up, is we're done for. We are done for. So we, we have to come together. This is a global issue. Uh, even if we did something here in Louisiana, that's not going to solve the problem. Sea levels will continue to rise. We have to start thinking on a global scale because the earth is not the way it was 50 years ago. Heck, the earth is not the way it was. 20 years ago, and it's getting, it's getting worse and it's getting to the point where we're going to have to make a decision. And so as your representative, I feel I'm in a prime uh, situation to make, help, help us to make that change from fossil fuels to clean energy we could start right here at home. Thank you, Mr. Rader. Judge Methvin. The thing we have to keep in mind is that we there is a human dimension to what we're dealing with uh, when we talk about the coastal master plan and the various projects that are proposed uh, we have to remember that th these are not just engineering problems but these are problems that are affecting people and families and people who have been in place where their culture, their, uh, their history, their ancestry is, is rooted to the places that we're talking about. Do we write them off or do we not? Um, so my, my son Connor works with Concordia in New Orleans and Concordia has worked with LA Safe and they have held community meetings in uh, some of the coastal communities that have been on the front lines that are really dealing with issues of whether or not people have to move. And I think it's important that we um, address this human dimension, that we involve the communities that are being affected in the conversation and that they be a part of the uh, empowered to come up with some of the solutions as well. So uh, Ile de Saint-Jean-Charles, uh, those folks were relocated. Uh, their, their homeland basically has been flooded. Uh, it's uninhabitable. Uh, this is going to happen to more and more places in Louisiana, and we just have to remember to include these folks in uh, empowering them to help come up with the solutions. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Guillory. I think ultimately the best way to combat this issue is to restore our coast, and that's why we're here today. And again, I'm not a civil engineer. I don't have all the answers, but at the end of the day, I believe it would take a mechanical or some kind of structural approach to either whether it's rocks or some kind of other uh, man-made mechanical uh, solution in our Gulf, in our marshes, siphon the salt water out and restore the, restore the land, whether redeposit, re-nurture, put dirt back where it was, where it once was, and restore the coast. Now, 
again, this, this coalition has answers, technology to do this. We have the answers out there. We've established that. But we know it takes money to do it. We know it takes resources to do it. That's my job when I go to Washington, and that's what I'm going to go and get. Now, I understand that we just attacked oil and gas, and, and we want to give it a bad name. I don't. I want oil and gas to come back, and I think it helps with our solution here. I think it helps with our solutions to coastal restoration because we've, we've talked about Go Mesa several times. Well, we need those offshore drilling contracts. We need those leases because we get tax revenue from that. So I want to promote oil and gas, and Mr. Rader, I want to promote renewable resources. I think that's good. I want to promote, I want to report uh, or uh, promote any any industry or any job making uh, or job maker out there to come to Southwest Louisiana because it's we're sitting in Calcasieu right now, and it is diversified. We are rocking and rolling, even within the petrochemical uh, industry. It is diverse diversity there, and we're creating jobs. But we are hurting when you go further east in our district to Berwick to Morgan City, and I want to stop that. I want jobs back in Southwest Louisiana and. That's what I'll fight for, and we can do that and restore our coast. Thank you, Mr. Guillory, and thank you all. That concludes our question and answer portion of, of this evening. And it's time now for our closing statement. Each of you will have two minutes, and we'll go in reverse order. We'll start with Mr. Guillory. Thank you. Again, to the coalition, to its partners, to everyone here that showed up, to my uh, fellow opponents and candidates, um, to include Mr. Verone Thomas, who's sitting here, everyone listening whether it's on KPL, uh, on TV, on Facebook Live, you're looking at four candidates, five candidates with Mr. Thomas that care, that cared enough to show up today. This issue is vital to our economy. It's vital to our state. It's vital, it's vital to our hunters and our fishermen. It's vital to so much of our way of life. And our congressman couldn't take the time to come and discuss these issues with us today. I think that disqualifies them right there. You can't fake caring. It's not what you say. It's what you do that counts. You can't sit here on other issues. You can't sit here and tell us that you're a conservative, Mr. Higgins, and you go to Congress and vote, our, vote to increase our national debt three times. Again, you can't say that you care about us if you can't show up to forums like this. You're in the district. You can't say you care about us if you go to Washington and vote to increase our flood insurance premiums without even coming up with an alternative solution. You can't say you're working hard for us, Mr. Higgins, if you missed 38 roll call votes since last year. And I think I made it clear that I wholeheartedly disagree with our congressman living outside of our district. I don't have all the answers, but I know what I believe in, I know how to fight, and I know I'll fight for this district. I believe in a smaller government. I believe the answers are here in this room for these issues, and I believe the answers are here in the private sector and, lo and, and local issues are addressed by local leaders best. I believe in a smaller federal government. I believe in balancing the budget, and I will fight every single day for our district well, as your representative, and I humbly ask for your support. Again, my name is Josh Guillory, number 22 on the ballot, and I ask for your support, and please check us out at votejosh2018.com. God bless you, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guillory. Judge Methvin. Thank you very much. Thank you to the coalition and uh, to our audience tonight, my fellow candidates. Um, and as Rob said, uh, we see each other a lot on the campaign trail, and we, we have a lot more in common than we <laughs> have uh, differences because uh, it's tough being a candidate. And, um, but we're here because we each have passion and belief in uh, our ability to make a difference. Um, I'm the only candidate that has worked in all three branches of the government, and I'm running because I believe I have the skill and the vision and the political will to make a difference. Um, I've worked uh, for a congressman. I have worked in the executive branch for the Department of Justice. I also worked for the Department of Interior under Secretary James Watt, which was a great example of a fox in the hen house. Uh, I was uh, helping to enforce environmental regulations in uh, Appalachia involving strip mining of coal. Uh, so I have that background as well. And then as a judge uh, for uh, over 28 years, I have uh, presided over cases. I presided over a master docket involving over 200 cases arising out of uh, Hurricane Rita. Uh, 
Jenny Jones, the DA in Cameron, was the lead uh, plaintiff's counsel in that and a, a real uh, key to helping us get those cases settled. So I have the background and I'm not taking corporate money, I'm not taking PAC money. I can speak independently and freely and honestly and authentically about what I see as uh, the problems, but I also know an important quality to bring is the ability to listen. Uh, we may not agree on all the issues, but we can have a conversation. And for a, a challenge as big as the one we're facing in Louisiana's coastal uh, issues, we need people to come together. We need the best minds and the best expertise, and we need an urgent uh, sense of of the uh, challenge that we have. So I'm Mimi Methvin, number 24, votememi.org is my website. Thank you all. Thank you, Judge Methvin. Mr. Rader. Uh, let me begin by thanking the uh, Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana for the opportunity to be here once again, as well as the uh, uh, audience here and the uh, audience that's listening in. Um, I wanna share a couple of little quick facts with you before we leave tonight. Five of the top 15 ports in the United States are located in Louisiana. Five of the top 15 ports are located here in Louisiana. 47% of Louisiana population lives right here in coastal zone population, right here. So this is a very extremely issue that touches every family, every home here in Louisiana, every family and every home. And it's gonna be a decision that we're gonna have to make. We, we can no longer put it to the side and say this is something that uh, we're gonna pass on to the next generation. I don't think we wanna leave that legacy behind. It's time for a change. It's time for a change. It's time we start moving forward here in Louisiana. The oil and gas industry has been great to us. I work for the oil and gas industry. I worked for them for eight years. I get a little check every month and it's a nice check. We don't wanna eliminate them. But what we do want to do, we do want to move forward. It's our future. It's our children's future. As a commissioner for the Port of Iberia, I understand what's going to happen in the years to come. I have that little window that I can see, and it's not very promising. So we have an opportunity here, and like I said earlier, I believe where there's a problem, there's an opportunity. I've been in business a very, very long time. Help me to help you so you could help your family. Vote number 25, I'm Larry Rader, www.larryraderforcongress.com. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Rader. And finally, Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you. Uh, Rob Anderson, Larry Rader, Mimi Methvin, Josh Guillory, Verone Thomas, Aaron Andrews, and finally, Clay Higgins, one of those seven is going to be your congressional representative in the third district here in Louisiana. That's a terrifying thought. Four of us are up here today, five in the, in the room. A large part of democracy, the constitutional republic that we live in, is showing up. You are as much a part of this process as we are. We just happen to be the ones with the lights glowing in our faces. I don't know if you know this, but we can't see any of you. There might be nobody out there uh, because the lights are right in our faces, part of that transparency. But I can hear you, so that's why I try to make jokes every now and then, to make sure you're still there. I am a first-time politician. I've worked in uh, a lot of uh, environmental drilling, setting environmental wells. I know a lot of times that the science is found by going out and digging and you look down under the ground and you find where your history has led you. you. You find the evidence of pollution you didn't know was there. You find all kinds of data. That's what science is for. It's not, uh, it shouldn't be subject to political whim. Science is science. It's a collection of data. And the data tells us that we need to act because it may already be too late for our part of Louisiana. If in 20 years, all of this might be underwater, unless we act, um, I will address a, a World Heritage Site named Venice, Venice, Italy. You've probably heard of it. If they had not acted and built levees and dams and the system they built in to protect that city, that city would no longer exist. And that's the exact kind of challenge we face here in the third district. It's time we acknowledge that. 
Mr. Anderson, thank you. And thank you all for your so very thoughtful answers tonight. We really appreciate you all taking the time with us this evening. You know, our next representative faces many important issues, and coastal land loss is among the most critical. Without bold science-based action and a true commitment to coastal restoration and protection, Louisiana will continue to disappear. We hope that this evening's forum has been informative and enlightening. I want to take this opportunity to thank Ryan Boriak, Dr. Mitchell Adrian for being here, our 27 partners who signed on to make sure that this vital conversation happened. I also want to thank all of you for being here. You have a voice, and you need to go out and vote. Early voting begins on Tuesday, October 23rd, and of course, Election Day is November 6th. Again, a big round of applause for our candidates, all five of them who are here. <laughs> I'm Jimmy Frederick. On behalf of the staff and the board of directors for the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, thank you all for being here and have a great night. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.